this computer. Okay, I'm now recording. Thank you. Um, oh, where was I? Okay, so the, 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 the city plan for Chicago, which was, you know, done right after the Columbia Exposition mm -hmm. and um, was frequently called out as being the beginning of modern city planning, even though it was imperfect, right? Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then describe the early efforts at zoning, also known as Euclidean zoning. Um, I'm trying to remember the early efforts. Uh, did they try to zone? I can't remember like which, like how they tried to zone back then. Um, it wasn't successful though, right? Well, it had problems. It was successful to deal with the big problems that they had, but it sort of created other issues. Mm -hmm. So they were worried about, you know, industrial uses right next to residential uses. So it was a two-dimensional, that's the key word here, two-dimensional way of segregating uses for health reasons. Okay. And in the process, they separated out sort of key features for livability, right? Right. And so the problem, <clears throat> early efforts at zoning um, were primarily two-dimensional where, you know, you had colored maps with different areas and they weren't properly sort of knitted together. All right. Does that make sense? It does. And Euclidean, Euclid, it, it was based on the town of Euclid, you know, sort of Supreme Court case, but I also remember it because Euclidean geometry is two-dimensional geometry, so I kind of remember it that way too, okay? Okay. All right. Why did regional and state planning start? Um, was it that they were like, they were wanting more of a um, cohesive type of planning or they wanted just more of a structured planning? Well, that, that's a good start on it. Um, I think in order to really fill in the question, you'd have to give some details. So what are the, what are the uh, planning components which really require close integration and a larger framework of reference, especially? They all do, but it started with these. Um. Okay, well think about the basis for our own Council of Governments, which are the three county system that we've got set up. Mm -hmm. Primarily deal with transportation issues, right? Right. So transportation was a big harbinger of, you know, creating these systems, but also anything that kind of crossed boundaries. You know, the Atlanta Regional Commission, for example, was initially set up to help with water and trying to create a source for water and manage the water more effectively because having it being done by all the different municipalities wasn't working out. Mm -hmm. um, and so also regional and state planning um, got started in order to maintain um, the infrastructure more effectively. Um, one of the things that we had around here for a long time and we're talking about putting back is a water district. So we, anytime we have a problem which is just overwhelms the local municipalities, we need to involve more of them in order to come up with more comprehensive solutions. That becomes a reason to do regional planning. And it could be all kinds of things. Okay. Okay, does that make sense? Sort of a gap count. It does. And then what is the problem with regional planning though? That's kind of the other half of the question. Mm -hmm. Is it like too like focused on like one area? and only concerned with like that area or? It can be, although remember that most of the regional planning efforts were primarily set up as a way to dispense of information, to create a, a, for, a source of information so that the individual governments would have a common sort of source and have you know that to use as a basis for planning. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem with regional planning, remember the, um, the um, I'm sorry, um, the, New Jersey, um, New York and New Jersey um, Commission, the one that was handling the World Trade Center and that sort of thing. They, they're the oldest one around, one of the oldest ones around, but um, they become known for being a little intransigent. They're not elected officials. And so consequently, they're not quite as receptive to public opinion. Okay. And so the problem is that it can become at least one step removed from the democratic process because most of the people involved are appointees. Okay. That makes sense? It does. Yeah. So people, you know, they like to be able to call up their city councilman and say, somebody needs to pick up my trash. And if they have a regional authority, there really isn't the same kind of setup, right? Okay. 
Okay. All right. This will, I'm going to throw open for everybody, whoever feels really want to talk about Ebenezer Howard and his grander vision. <clears throat> Is the the Garden City? Go ahead, Ellis. Yeah, he he wanted to to make the the Garden City. Um, right. He he want he yeah he wanted to like space out everything very orderly and um, uh very yeah very orderly and um you know you still have rural areas and green areas um. Yeah, he has that funny looking pie shaped diagram, right? Which is just a diagram. It's not meant to be a real plan, right? And obviously terrain and you know other things will influence the shape of the plan, but I you've got the essence of it. It was a mixture of urban and um rural areas to try to make sure that um cities didn't get so large as to start generating a lot of the problems. You remember what the basis for his planning was? Some I mean the, some of the basic ideas it needed in order for it to not be polluting it needed electricity right mm -hmm. so electricity was kind of the basis of it um also transportation railway transportation in particular in order to weave these areas together without having a lot of highways <clears throat> um and um, also another thing which is really necessary in order to complete his vision of planning and keep it from being one that would be overcome by the land speculators and by the sprawl, you know, which is really the result of land speculation, um, is having sort of, um, I shall say, common ownership of the land. And this has always made it problematic that we have this vision of what we should do, but we don't have control over it. And so it starts off that way, but the speculators end up taking over. Or capitalism, as Yante likes to talk about it, which is valid. Does that uh, mesh with what you were thinking? Yeah. Cool. All right, so let's just, I'm gonna go through the rest of these um, quickly. I'm just, what I wanted to do there was to Get the questions out there, let you see the response is this, and I need to show my familiarity with the concept in a certain way by giving examples um, and using, you know, reasonably straightforward language and give it a little bit of context. That's a way to kind of respond to this rather than just saying interconnected and complexity. Well, what does that mean? Tell me about it a little bit. It doesn't have to be a long answer, but a couple of lines is good. All right, Dylan's rule. We all know that real quick. Anybody? Uh, the states have control. They have all the power. Of the cities. Of and the that cities. Compared, that compares to uh, the other approach, which is... Home. home rule. Exactly. Although home rule, to some extent, is a reflection of Dylan's rule in that it has to be codified in the state, but it still is a different approach. Eminent domain and police power. Whoops. Everybody can see these questions, right? Yes. Okay, very good. So eminent domain it's an, is an example of using police power. So when the police come and, and charge you, um, they're charging you. They're saying you've broken the law or you've worked against public safety, right? In the same way, when you start talking about land use, they come at you and say, this land doesn't work towards the public benefit, and therefore we're going to buy it from you or take it from you, right? I'm sorry, take it from you. Um, we'll take out certain rights that you have to it. So eminent domain is where you actually can come in and um, uh, buy out a property owner who has access, who has rights to his property. Police power is when you come in and say, I'm sorry, you just are non-conforming. What you're doing is a violation of public safety. We don't have to recompense you anything. You have to change your ways. So there are two different things. Okay, and so that relates directly to zoning and takings. Takings is an example of eminent domain where we take it. And what we try to do with zoning is to keep from taking property because that we need to pay for that. Um, but basically set it up under the idea of um, 
you know, that this is within the police power of the cities. This is within the right of the cities to try to control, you know, the, the, the public interest. Um, and we start talking about takings. Remember that court case that um, illustrated sometimes how far the, um, the cities have gone and maybe gone a little too far? Do you remember that one? Honestly, was it, was it like in the late 1800s? No, no, no. This is fairly recent. Remember, we saw the video about it. Yeah, I, I can't remember the title of the court case, but it was when that woman bought a house and then they kicked her out to build some factory or plant and then they just never built it and their house was just still there. Right. No, exactly. And so you got it right. So that was Kilo versus, you remember? Uh, Connecticut? It was, it was some northeastern state. Yep, you got it. You got it. Um, so I'm actually I'm trying to remember Kilo versus New London. It was New London, Connecticut. That's right. I for a moment was flashing on it. It's hard for me to talk and think at the same time sometimes. You know what I mean? <laughs> but yeah. Um, equal protection statutes. What's that all about? So when somebody says. Um, you're violating my equal protection. That's about the amendments to the Constitution. That's where you zone something, making it impossible for you to be able to afford a house there. And so you can be sued under equal protection, saying that you need to provide some opportunity for me to be able to afford to live there. That would be one example of equal protection, that everybody needs to have equal protection and not one group needs it more than others. Of course, right now we're looking at a lot of issues which can be interpreted that way as it particularly relates to police violence and stuff, right? De facto planning, we talked a little bit about last time, is sort of what happens in fact in planning, things get planned whether they are planned or not, like building the expressway has a tremendous influence on the plan of a city, even though no one really start initially at looking at land use. And what we found is that we really need to look at both. So de facto is kind of, by the way, we're doing planning whether we want to admit it or not. Balkanization is kind of a funny term. You could find that by Googling it. That's where our society is broken up into little pieces now. And we don't have the same kind of unity as we perhaps one did, although I'm sure that's a little controversial. Just think we have more people who have a voice and that's not necessarily a bad thing except when we're using our voice to holler at each other instead of trying to think things through. PUD, now there's a acronym for you. Somebody remember what a PUD is? A planned unit development. That's, some, that's something you really probably should know because planned unit development is becoming more and more popular in the face of um, zoning, why do you reckon? Jason, are you still in the car? Yes, sir, sorry. All right, so plan your development. So, you know, you're faced with all these planning requirements and you end up basing your design on the setbacks and the, you know, various requirements instead of saying, okay, the object of these requirements are to create natural spaces, open spaces, livable spaces. Let me take that and make that the basis of this and we'll set up the whole sort of organization so it works towards those objectives. Because what people find is that, you know, if you set up, you know, um, a development based on the same setback and the same kind of criteria for each lot, that what you end up with is kind of stale. And so that's the typical problem with zoning. If you go down any subdivision, you can see it is everything's the same. The sameness of it gets to be a little bit crazy sometimes. So with plan unit development, you can introduce more design, but still satisfy the overall objectives of that zoning ordinance. Does that kind of make sense, guys? So yeah. it's just it's just a plan that works towards an, an objective? The larger objectives of the zoning. Okay. So if they say we, we want like four units per acre, we want to have, you know, a significant open space, we want to have it linked to transportation planning, then instead of putting specific requirements on every aspect of the development, you put general sort of requirements on the whole thing, and the developer can choose to meet those in various ways. 
thereby whenever you get a PUD status, you get approval for the whole thing, then you can go through and just develop it without having to stop each time and have to defend yourself to the public saying, well, this may violate zoning in some respects, but you can see we're making up for it in other areas. The public doesn't usually buy that. They get a little defensive, right? Planned unit development, PUD. All right, cool. Environmental racism, there's a big term. We see a lot of examples of that and some concern that some of that's going to be going on as we plan for the wall. Isn't it, <clears throat> isn't it basically when uh, cities show like least less favorable like environmental conditions for like um, areas that are like non-white or like minority areas, I should say. That's right. Like, for example, they put like, I don't know, maybe like pollu pollution factories close or I don't know, they maybe don't like clean it up or make it look nice, something like that. Well, that's what tends to happen is that the, you know, the poor areas end up with the industry because they're looking at larger tracts of land and cutting their costs and all that. Uh, but then it creates problems. I mean, you can see an example of that recently, at least, and not now, but in the incinerator that was placed up on the neck, which was putting a lot of poor Rosemont and areas like that downwind of it and causing problems for them. Or the expressways that tend to go through poor neighborhoods and all the pollution and health issues, and, you know, safety issues associated with those, you know, um, go along with it. So environmental racism is where we are um creating you know less than um good uh, conditions for people based on um the fact that you know they are the the uh, less expensive areas and we're disproportionately affecting those but it also relates to some extent too in what's happening recently and that a lot of the environmental planning essentially is being done at the expense of social planning you see what i'm saying and so it's not hard to see that there are a lot of nature buffs out there whose primary concern is interpreted as preserving nature, but in the process they forget about other things. For example, Kiowa Island was developed as a design with nature community, but there's no opportunity for anybody else to live out there. In fact, they're excluded by just the cost of the place and stuff. So it creates an exclusionary situation. So environmental racism is, you know, looking at environmental concerns without paying proper sort of um, respect to social conditions that are created. Is that a reasonable enough, big enough definition maybe to be able to handle all those conditions I just talked about? Right? Make sense to you, Yonte? Yeah, I'm trying to touch. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so Berman versus Parker, current legal thinking and the use of eminent domain and the transfer of property. Um, Berman versus Parker. I, I now have a sheet online where I go through all of the, um, um, I should say, court cases, so you can easily look those up. Um, and I'm just kind of going down my own notes here to see where I've got oh, bits and pieces of it. Yeah, here. Um, yeah, Berman versus Parker allowed for the taking of private property with just compensation for public use. So that was the basis for that. Um, so we can, you know, change the use of it as long as we pay people for it. That was that particular court case. And what is the current thinking in the use of eminent domain and transfer of property? This goes back to Kilo versus the town of New London where now we are cutting back a little bit on the rights of cities to just decide on what's the, in the public interest and asking for it to do, deal more directly with public health, safety, and welfare. But this goes back and forth. You can see the court cases go back and forth over time. And why is local planning so political? Well, because it's local, because it involves money, it involves people's quality of life, because people can see it, you know, and everybody thinks that they're an expert at it. So yeah, planning is political. All right, and then significance of the master plan and local planning, what does it usually include? Well, there are specific elements in the master plan that are in the textbook, which um, I would refer you to, um, but they are, you know, enumerated there. Um, 
pretty closely. Um, as I look at it here, um, master plan and local planning usually include looking at the whole situation analysis, which is information gathering and so forth, and then synthesis, evaluation and implementation and coordination. So that's kind of the basic, you know, sort of phases, which I'm just kind of jumping through lightly, but you can look more fully at that and see, you know, what's involved in each. And it's pretty self-explanatory, really, I think. Um, but the master plan um, is an idea that was very popular, and now we still do master planning, but one of the points that I made um, is that we tend to be moving more towards strategic planning now rather than master planning because we're trying to um, be flexible in what is the actual result of it what actually happens so that we can deal with changing economic situations. Oh, boy, I'm getting tired. I've been talking for almost an hour. Uh, revenue bonds versus general obligation bonds. There you go, Ellis. That's perfect for you, right? Business mind. Um, so revenue bonds are based on? Revenue. That's right. General obligation bonds involves the entire. Um, go ahead. No, no, no. Sorry, you you, you go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> right. General obligation means that the a city is that has signed themselves up. Their credit worthiness is at stake. They have to pay these bonds. Revenue bonds are based on anticipated future revenue. General obligation bonds has to be based on the revenue on hand. Therefore, the credit will credit worthiness of the place. So there's a limit, just like with people, you know, you can only get so much credit card debt before they won't give it to you anymore, right? So general obligation bonds are a bit like that. So, you know, you're limited in how much you want to do general obligation bonds. Revenue bonds are like the parking garages. We build all these parking garages, anticipation of money coming in from the receipts of the parking garage. CIP, now what the hell is that? I'm trying to remember myself. Oh yes, ah yes, yes, yes. CIP, capital improvement planning. Now this gets at, you know, the kind of planning that we do for capital development, which is one of the two ways that and zoning that um, urban centers, can, uh, urban planners can use to influence growth and development in the private sector. And then TDR, that's an easy one. Uh, one that's very important is the transfer of development rights where we take development that could have occurred in another area, but we want to, you know, hold it down a little bit, and we give the developer those rights in another parcel. And the one that we frequently look to is the Pennsylvania Station case, where instead of building on top of Pennsylvania Station on the historic building, we gave the company rights to develop the equivalent elsewhere um, so that we could leave that place alone. Transfer of development rights. And there's also PDR, which is purchase of development rights, where you can actually purchase those. And what are the tools of land use planning? Well, those would be zoning and capital improvement plans. That's a kind of repeat of what we just talked about. You have a few advantages and problems in the traditional zoning laws. Well, we talked about that where, you know, you have two-dimensional planning and that creates, you know, kind of a, a stale situation. How do issues outside the local area affect planning within those areas? Well, they're interconnected. So that goes back to the same, you know, response that we had earlier. Oh boy, we got some more stuff to go through. Um, fields of planning, neighborhood, edge city, uh, community development, community development block grants, um, underwater housing prices, robo signing, ninja loans, teaser rates, other people's money, OPM, induced demand. These are all elements that we talked about as part of the meltdown of the economy. Uh, at least see, um, underwater housing prices, robo signing, ninja loans, teaser rates, other people's money. That was something that we talked about as far as the meltdown of the, of the economic system in 2007. Um, in terms of neighborhood, how would anybody, all right, I'm going to pick on you, Matt. How would you define a neighborhood? Just a, uh, a group of houses. I don't, I don't know. The kind of community, it's, it's a neighborhood that has to be there. With, like there has to be a neighborhood with a community. Okay, so it's somewhat self-sustaining, which includes not just houses, but also businesses and services of various sorts, right? Yeah. 
And then some of the local modern planners have defined that it needs to be within, you know, a thousand foot walking or, you know, quarter mile radius so that you can get to it readily. Um, so neighborhoods are kind of self-sustaining units, which has the services and so forth that it takes to kind of keep those people together. It could also include schools, and libraries, parks, and, you know, stuff like that, right? So you don't have to go outside of that. Edge cities, uh, that's an easy one. That's a city that occurs along the edge of a city. So community development funds versus community development block grants. Um, those are two methods that were used after um, urban renewal to try to, you know, make uh, money for more flexible for individual places and more gradual. All right. So induced demand means essentially you're talking about highways. Uh, induced demand means when you build it, they will come. You build a highway, all of a sudden you get more people using it just because it's there and they want to get on it, I guess. Um, define the difference between Ed City and transit oriented development. They're exactly the opposite. Transit oriented development are like we were talking about with um, the um, bus rapid transit, the BRT, um, which has nodes and villages along the way versus an Edge City, which is primarily a car dominated um, semi city, if I can call it that, at the edge of the, at the outside edge of the city. Um, good urban design. You tell me, but the textbook has various, you know, sort of words that they use, but it has to do with um, unity and coherence, uh, minimizing the conflict with the automobile, um, protection from elements, um, easy orientation, being able to find your way around it, compatibility of adjoining uses, which also can include mixed uses, of course, places to rest, socialize, security and pleasantness, and you could add to it, I suppose, other things like affordable housing, about resiliency and those kinds of things to it based on the criteria we've set out for these courses. Um, now, one of the things I would recommend, since these are quite a few questions, this is from the whole reading of the entire textbook, is that maybe you could just find where these questions are written about in the text. And so when you get the, the test, you'll have 24 hours, you'll know where to go look for the answers. You don't have to memorize these. That's one of the advantages of a take home, right? So you can prepare ahead of time. All right, let's see. Did, did, did the urban renewal been good or bad for cities? We talked a lot about that. Um, what's not to like about urban renewal? Jason, what do you think? Are you still driving? Yes, he is. Um, urban renewal, um, it, uh, it ended up uh, kind of killing communities because it uh, made those really big uh, Apartment complex developments, is that correct? We're talking about, you know, the Housing the housing Act. Urban renewal was initially just hit there to demolish things and very little got put in its place right away. And it ended right, up right. gentrification, right? But you've got the right idea. Yeah. Yeah, good, super. Um, so it's been good for cities only if you look at it in terms of long term. Um, but in the short term, it's resulted in um, um, less housing opportunity and, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and so right now, you know, we have a more gradual approach, which uses the community development block grants based on the revised um, community development standards instead of urban renewal. So community development took the place of urban renewal. And it's basically I, the idea is that you would do it more gradually and not so suddenly, which is a tremendous shock to the system. To the, to the, you know, sort of livability of the city. Um, how do federal efforts affect housing? How does it differ from the rich middle? Well, that has a lot to do with taxes, doesn't it? And how much tax write-off you give to the uh, middle class for their home mortgages versus direct subsidy to people who can't afford homes. Um, and we look at it, and it's pretty disproportionate the amount of support that we give either face. So three factors that led to the housing crash of 2006, greed, greed, and greed. No, no, that's not it. <laughs> what would you say? All right, Yante, you seem to be the um, person who wants to really talk about the problems with capitalism. What happened in the housing crash that made it happen? Um, do you remember much about it? Um, did it have something to do with like corruption? Well, yeah. Corruption, but the corruption needs to be described a little bit more explicitly in terms of some of the things that actually happened. Some of the terms that I have up here 
um, underwater housing prices, ninja loans, robo siding, teaser rates, using other people's money. Those all relate to factors that um, played into the housing crash. We had properties that really weren't, um, um, how shall I say, properly set up. In other words, they didn't make sense financially, but they got packaged with others and it was impossible to separate them. So you ended up not being able to really, um, um, how shall I say, tell what was a good investment or not. You were, you know, kind of, it was too complicated. Created um, all kinds of issues in terms of trying to have accountability in the banking process. And this related directly to the, 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 uh, the uh, how shall I say, the getting rid of Glass Steagall, which said basically you couldn't gamble with other people's money, and that's what the banks were doing. They were taking everybody's money, putting it together, and then investing it and gambling with it. What it boiled down to. But so you can find these terms back up here for the um, housing crash. All right, and then the how do engineers go about figuring on traffic loading and highway planning? A lot of this has to do with figuring out you know, the demographics of an area, figuring out how many trips they're likely to make, what, you know, type of um, means they're going to use, usually automobile, how they're going to split it up in various areas. Um, you know, there's a four-part process there. I did put out um, an article about how it's different in, in Holland and other places where they make part of the whole planning process instead of just reactive, somewhat proscriptive, in other words, the whole bicycle infrastructure and so forth is placed in there specifically to try to alleviate traffic. And if you look at it in broad terms, you can see that the whole methodology that the engineers use for figure traffic loading is actually creating the induced demand, if you follow me there. So yeah, the textbook says it, but you, know, you can see it in a broader context if you take it to the next level. Oy. I'm going to pick on just a few of these. Structural unemployment. Matt, remember that one? I remember. Uh, I don't think so. All right. So remember during the Depression, we had a lot of people who bet on the farms, and the farms are no longer viable, but then there were businesses moving in, and they weren't trained to do it, right? So it's when you have a mismatch of the workforce and the jobs where the workforce really can't do the jobs. Yeah, all right. And that can happen on lots of different levels. Um, displacement, that's basically moving people out. NIMBY, that's an easy one. Hmm, what do you think? Matt, you wanna pick up on that one? NIMBY, that's an acronym. Uh. Not in my back yard. Yeah. In other words, yeah, no, we don't want it here. There's a new, there's a new uh, movement called YIMBY, which is yes in my backyard, where people are trying to say, yes, we want to recognize urban influences and not just be defensive and saying, oh, we want are residential uses. So it's kind of interesting how that's played out. But anyway, sprawl, you know, two similar land uses, dependent on the automobile, um, not sort of knitted with the rest of the city, not very livable. You can you know, refer to it in several different ways. Sustainability, we talked about that a lot later. There's a term which I have mentioned and want to repeat again, per capita loading versus carrying capacity. Per capita loading would be, you know, let me see, I'm sorry, let me put it that way. Per capita loading is the amount of infrastructure that you need per person, okay? With sewer, water, police, whatever, infrastructure versus carrying capacity, and, and before I get into that, per capita loading we find is the denser the population, the less the cost to take care of it per person, per capita, right? But then that comes up against a brick wall called carrying capacity, and that is where if we actually have the infrastructure to deal with it, even if it is more affordable, but if we don't have the infrastructure, or if it causes a problem which subverts the whole system, then we have a problem with our carrying capacity, how much we can actually have there. So these are two principles which come to, to each other and need to be um, sort of worked out in order to really decide on the appropriate um, density of an area. Economic development planning. Oh, I'm gonna go back to Ellis for this one. 
economic, what are the arguments for and against doing economic development planning? Now, I hope you noticed that I put a PowerPoint in there about economic development planning, which drew a difference there. But anyway, what, what are you saying here? What are the arguments for and against economic development planning? Well, um, I did get that, uh, that email and uh, no, no, I did look at that. The, it's on the module and I just alluded to it on one of our headlines. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, that, that economic development versus uh, economic growth, I guess. So uh, economic development's more like how we can make a, a community better, more um, economically viable, like lay, uh, raise the standard of living, uh, et cetera. And then economic growth is this, you know, linear kind of curve, I guess, or a, a line where, uh, you know, that there's economic growth, but like, how is it allocated? So I guess development's more like how well, is, is the money possible? allocated in a, in a community? Is it sustainable? Does it help the city as a whole? You know, right. And a lot of times yeah. economic, um, development or yeah, economic uh, planning just benefits a few at the expense of the many. Right. And so, I mean, I think you had this, correct me if I'm wrong, but you kind of had, this was your um, least favorite aspect I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but, and I understand that because uh, the way economic development is today, it's really not economic development. It's more like economic growth. You know, let's build a bunch of stadiums or, yeah. you know, um, let's build this, uh, this trade show stadium where, you know, yeah, it looks good. And everybody says it's going to make money, but then like five, five years down the road, it's, you know, it's hemorrhaging money. It's not really, it's yeah. not really, uh, yeah, yeah, so. It doesn't help. I'm a, I'm a child right. of, the, of Atlanta, you know. I went to high school in Atlanta, and I saw what happened to Atlanta. Ivan Allen was the mayor who's really started the city off on its exponential growth. He used to have a sign on the highway that listed there that, that had the number of the number of people in the city. And it was a big celebration when it hit a million. Um, and you know the the idea of development at the time was to build an expressway around the city and fill it full of every franchise and call it growth, right? Right. On one level, that's true, but on another level, it's a hell of a place to have to live. And so, economic development has a little bit more to do with livability and culture and long-term sort of considerations rather than just looking at making money. And I think we don't really disagree with each other on that in that regard. We're just trying to draw a distinction there. Well, and what happens is economic growth or economic, yeah, economic growth is really just what economic development is. People say, oh, we're going to, it's economic development, but not really. It's just economic growth. Let's just, yeah. yeah so. Economic development is looking at developing something longer term that fits within the community and that builds structure. Um, rather than just making a few people rich. Exactly. All right. So how does local economic benefit those areas? Um, I think we've just talked about that. How do local communities do it? Okay, how do local communities provide a, a, a place where businesses can thrive? Well, some would say uh, low taxes. Yep, that's part of it. That's right. And it's true. I mean, it's definitely true. Uh, look at, you remember that whole thing with a couple of years ago, um, Amazon's second he headquarters, like people were just, cities were just clamoring over each other to like, oh, come here, please come here. And um, and so, yeah, it's, it's a competition between cities. And usually the way they compete is, oh, I have the lowest cost of living. I have the lowest amount of taxes. Right. So yeah, they lower taxes. They also subsidize businesses, you know, um, by um, reducing the taxes, they're essentially subsidizing it. Um, they also help sell the place. You know, the, if you think about Charleston, there's a lot of sales efforts here, the wildlife festival, Spoleto, a lot of it trying to sell the place that the businesses are a part of. So it's promotion. Um, they also have the tax increment finance districts, the TIFs, which is a worthwhile concept to keep idea. That is to, Money, new money raised in an area stays in the area to help with the, the expansion of just that area. 
Um, also finding sites. You see all these industrial parks around. That's the city going around and is developing these sites and making them available for business to come into. That's what made the difference in getting Boeing here. That was a project I was involved in before I went to Bermuda was to set up the network of highways and businesses and zoning and permitting around the airport so that it would create a business environment that you know uh, folks could move into. Um, we had no idea it would be Boeing. We thought it would be a series of smaller um, businesses, but Boeing was able to come in and swallow up you know, most of them just on that whole side over there. Um, so that you're providing sites. Um, we have places like the Cigar Factory, which are considered incubators for buildings, uh, for, um, I'm sorry, incubators for businesses. Um, they develop revolving loans to try to keep low interest rates for businesses that come in. They're using that a lot right now with the technical um, sector, I mean, the IT sector coming into town um, to try to promote that. Charleston is a place for that. And then, of course, trying to maintain the, um, the zoning so as to make it propitious for people to be there. So local communities can have a great effect on it. So it's not all just done on a state level. Ooh, and growth management, that's a, there's a whole chapter about that just about, but it's essentially dealing with the regulation of amount, timing, location, and character of development, which uh, growth management has frequently been seen as part of the state and regional planning efforts. Um, it also, you can see, um, doesn't deal much with social equity issues. It's all about the logistics of development. Um, let's see, state level growth management usually governed by what overriding concern? Now that's pretty simple, that's environment. Most, if you think about, um, you know, the, um, the, the issues right now with water, um, with the marsh in particular, development of the marsh, these are mandated by the state and carried on through the city. So typically that's what the state's been involved in because those are broader issues and also transportation. Smart growth has been less successful in working through the issues in existing development. Okay, so discuss with West Ashley in mind. Smart growth really depends on having a blank slate. And when you're dealing with existing development, um, that's problematic. So we see all these terms that have come up at a particular time dealing with particular sort of methods, and it gets downright confusing. Because what's not to like about smart growth? What's not to like about growth management, you know? Um, but if you look at it in terms of the context, the historical context of where they are, they meant certain things at the time. And to some extent, this is just, you know, city planners playing with your brains, coming up with a new concept for talking about it. But, you know, refer to the textbook. It tries to anchor it into the sort of context of the time so that you understand, you know, what people are talking about. And we've already talked about per capita loading versus carrying capacity. Um, we're talking about national government overstep its usefulness in providing solutions to local areas. We talked about that last class pretty well. Um, what do you find most compelling and most concerning about the development of regional planning? So, all right, let's talk about national government overstep its usefulness. What would be a classic example of that? Holland, you haven't spoken up in a while. What is one of the biggest things that the federal government has done that influenced our, our, our future here? Um, I mean, I think transportation like, yep, is a big one. <laughs> is that the one? Yep, that's a big one. Okay, that's definitely a big one. And they've overstepped their boundaries because they've influenced so many other things without proper regard of the sort of nuances, right? Right. Exactly, cool. Very good. Um, and local areas need to have some flexibility in how these things get implemented. And that's something that is slowly coming around. It is coming around more now. If you wanted to, you could use, regardless of your position on 526, you can look at the history of 526 and see the 12 different alternatives that were set out. And the final one that was chosen was done directly as a result of the local areas trying to have more control over it, not just um, depending on the same uniform application of um, interstate highway laws being applied on that as well. So you can see that in a couple of ways. All right, Holland, while you're at it, what do you think is the worth of regional planning? And what do you see as being the problems? We kind of talked about the problem before, but what do you think is most compelling about regional planning? 
Um, I think, I don't know. It's hard for me because I know we talked about the regional. That was the one where the public opinion is not always involved, right? That's right. That would be the negative aspect of it. But okay. if you think about regional planning in the context of trying to do something about sea level rise, what's the advantage of it? They could get a lot done because they don't have to wait like forever for public opinion and they can bypass some of that. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But they can also deal with the situation, at least in theory, more comprehensively. Uh, right? Because environmental um, environment doesn't change just because you go across a county line or whatever. It, it, they frequently are not governed by the same kinds of things. Political. Okay. Yep, yep, yep. Very good. Um, and then we talk about the factors in Europe and Asia that's different. In Europe, they have the EU, they have a tradition of socialism, they have World War II, um, they have a tradition of providing housing, they have a different kind of governance system that is perhaps more bureaucratic, but also allows for more contribution initially and then none later in the process. Asia is different because it's much more um, top down. Um, maybe more efficient, but also less democratic. I guess you could say that. Ellis, you had a good commentary in your response paper. Do you want to embellish that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, well, yeah, just talking about how um, in Asia and um, South Central America, which I was surprised that the book didn't really talk anything, to talk any about. I did bring it up though, didn't I? Yeah, you did you, uh, in your lecture, but um, just how most people in those big cities live in slums and, um, you know, we think we're facing uh, different crises and, and cities over here, but I mean, compared to, to, to Asia and even Central South America, but especially Asia, um, is really uh you know it's not really comparable um and the thing is uh these as more and more people i guess uh, move into these cities they're they're not going to be able to really find adequate housing and so more and more people are going to be living in slums Favela. And, uh, huh favelas yeah biden bills yeah 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 um yeah, it, yeah, it's 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 scary. Um, that book I to told you about. Uh, have you read that book or heard of I that not, author? I have it listed on my notes here. What was it? I highly Planet recommend it. Slums is the one you refer yeah. to. Yeah, yeah, I highly recommend it. It's one of the best books I've ever read. Um, but it, it, it's very. It's not light reading. Let's just say that it, it took me a well, while. It. It. <laughs> but. Um, so probably, in, like in the next fifty years, most most people will be living in slums uh, in the world, which is pretty scary to think about. And the biggest but, cities will occur in Asia, not in and in, in um, Africa, and maybe well to some extent in South America, especially Brazil. Well, um, I wouldn't even say some extent. I mean, South America is really bad when it comes to that. Like the governments, uh, the, these local governments, just like pretty much destroy these slums and just like come in with, you know, these armed like paramilitary uh, cops and that, you know, they just get out of here. Like they just push them farther and farther out into the, the periphery. So it, it's really bad in South America, especially Brazil. But um, yeah, yeah, it's just. Uh, well, Rio would be an interesting case study. I mean, during the Olympics, um, they were really bad about, forcing people out and stuff like that. But they've got a new um, mayor there who's trying to work with the favelas and trying to civilize them. And so, you know, things change pretty radically. Um, you know, when I was in Lima, we had um, blocks set aside for people who were indigent that they would have to leave in the evening. They were not allowed to be on the streets in the evening. They'd have to go into these blocks until you had all these shanties set up. And they were rampant with disease, and people would kick over their kerosene lanterns and have big fires that would kill hundreds of people at one time. It was just awful stuff, but this was part of the city policy. That was one reason why, you know, Peru in particular was very keen on bringing in this uh, Japanese administrator who really, you know, shaped things up in kind of a top down fashion, but it really needed to happen. Um, and, you know, so you're right. But um, this is an emerging 
um, area, and there are changes happening all the time, some of them for the good. Um, it's hard to keep that in mind sometimes. South America is, is a really desperately important place, which we need to be spending more effort looking at, for sure. Definitely. Yep. I mean, it's, it's a source for most of our natural resources, including um, gasoline, for that matter. Um, yep. blah, 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 blah. You know, most people don't realize the extent of damage that U.S. corporations have had in South America, Anaconda aluminum and the aluminum mining that's occurred in the mountains, the gold mining, you know, that sort of thing. Um, cocaine. Pardon? Cocaine. Well, yeah, that's yeah. Sort of thing. <laughs> I wasn't even Well, I mean, that. so the war on drugs, and I mean, that's had a huge impact on, on right. places in South America and Central America where I think in some countries, narco trafficking, if you, it's like, you know, of course, it's not formal, but it's the largest part of their economies. Yeah. And they're, they're to the point now where they're almost states in and of themselves. And this is deeply problematic. It becomes out of control. All right. So very good. Very good. I appreciate your bringing up South America. Um, how does ideological perspectives alter the process of public goods, spillover, that sort of thing? So we talked about the different approaches to planning. You remember that? Um, Jason, do you remember those different approaches? Remember there was the rational approach and then there were some other approaches. Remember those? I don't. So there's the rational approach. Then there's uh, my favorite, the SWOT analysis, looking at, you know, opportunities and threats and, um, you know, uh, I forget what SW stands for, but basically looking at what's happening that's good and what's happening that's bad, trying to analyze the field and come up with a way forward um, there's another one that's called muddling through, at least what I call it, um, that's basically looking at the whole situation, prioritizing and starting at the top and figuring it out as you go, uh, based on the idea that as soon as you change one thing, it changes everything else. So you really don't want to get too crazy at coming up with details until um, you get into it and then things are going to change. So you have to be flexible, quick on your toes. And then there's the ideological perspective. Um, which has to do with redistribution of wealth, you know, perhaps socialism. Um, those kinds of things are public health issues. You know, people are becoming very ideological about public health. Uh, basically, it's almost single issue about that or look at it in terms of racism. I'm not saying that ideological approaches are wrong. They're just a different approach. And right now we're seeing a lot of emphasis on social equity issues, which is an ideological perspective. Um, so... There we are. Um, so yeah, the ideological perspective changes the process, has a lot to do with you know, how we distribute public goods. Um, how, should we deny the hungry, um, lest when their stomachs are full, they will lose their righteous anger about being hungry? Now this is an uh, idea that comes straight out of the 60s. It's a real, real politique idea. But this relates to the idea of co-opting. Now, this is interesting, I think. Um, co-opting, we used to talk about people being co-opted. Has anybody ever used that term before for you? Guys, anybody? He's been co-opted. What do you think that means? No idea? Okay. Of a person, you know, go ahead, Deontay, you, you wanted to speak? Um... I just don't want to sound dumb, so no. <laughs> no, I'm not dumb. Come on now. A person's been co-opted. Say somebody has been a strong advocate for civil rights, right? Yeah. Arguing. Um, then all of a sudden they get a job working for the city where they're paid to deal with civil rights, but they're part yeah. of the democracy. Um, maybe like co co like they're cooperating with. <laughs> I have no idea. I don't. I, I don't. You're doing well. You're doing well. You've got the idea. So you saw the example that I said. People's priorities change based yeah. on the fact that they're money or benefits from the system in some way, right? Yeah. They've been co-op. That's, that's what I was thinking, but I couldn't like formulate it in my mind. <laughs> yeah, I, I. Yeah, that's I, like like I was saying before. I think you've got a handle on it. You just need to loosen up with it, and we need to talk about it. I hope this is helpful in that regard. But. Um, Co-opting is where, you know, we used to talk a lot about that in the 70s where there was a lot of anti-war movement and that sort of thing. And then all of a sudden people had to go out 
and make a living and they got co-opted by the whole middle class thing and having their house in the suburbs and all the rest of it they no longer had time to go out on the streets and demand social justice anymore they were too busy making a living they were co-opted that's a kind of a term that we use and the, the idea here in this statement is should we deny food to the hungry lest when their stomachs are full they will lose their righteous anger about being hungry so just to, to what and this is a common ploy that society i guess you could say uses is that if they have a group that is upset about something, they give them just enough to make to satisfy their hunger, and then lo and behold, they you know are no longer out in the streets anymore. They've got other things to worry about, and so they do just enough to placate them, and then you know they don't have the the governance, the place, the power structure no longer has the problem. So people who've been involved in real politique, you know, the people in Russia, for example, during the Russian Revolution, they kept times hard on purpose so that people would be upset and they would strive for a justice, a change, it, and so forth. They were after the whole, you know, sort of throwing down of the entire system. And so they kept everybody upset and, you know, needing that. But yeah, the idea of co-opting is both a good thing and a bad thing, I think you could say. I mean, you know, and the idea that societies can change. The question, the, the implication here behind co-opting is they don't change any more than they absolutely have to. Is that kind of, can you see that fitting into the... To the Dante? Yeah. So in other words, if I were to say to you, that taking down John C. Calhoun from the park is a way to try to co-opt the resistance movement that's going on right now. Can you see how maybe that's applicable or maybe that's an overstatement or how would you interpret that? Mm, um, I mean, genuinely, I feel like it's just kind of like um, gaslighting slightly, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't really want to give my opinion, <laughs> but I, yeah, I feel like it's applicable to a certain extent. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, everybody takes, I mean, that's why I think we need to be careful about what we decide is, you know, what we need to do right now and not be yeah, just I agree. off on statutes. You know, I mean, he can stay out there as long as he damn well wants. It doesn't influence whether we have affordable housing or whatever. He's a symbol and symbols are important. But as long as it as long as it also generates real change. Yeah, exactly. That's that's why I said I feel like it's ga like gaslighting, like just putting a band-aid on top of a wound that's definitely no not even close to being healed. <laughs> so I mean yeah, your term gaslighting is an interesting one that has subtle differences. Are you familiar with the define gaslighting for me, if you don't mind? Because I think that's a useful concept, just as useful as co opting well i just feel like they're trying like it's, it's it sounds good and it looks good but as a black american when you actually examine like the 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 means for why they did it you, you kind of just see that it's just bs honestly it's just they're just doing it to try to shut us up like that's all they're not doing it to implement any real changes or to actually stand with you know oppressed black people they're just doing to try to shut us up like that's why that's what i mean by gaslighting it's just a way to kind of manipulate us into yeah. not in, into just being okay being okay with like the climate of like every other thing that has been going on in our community that's it's, just how i feel but my my sense of it in this and i'm not trying to be overly academic here but what you're describing is actually co-option <laughs> is a subtle difference i think it's where um people try to get you to question your own legitimacy, right? Yeah, yeah. Or provide an alternate view of history or reality. And who's really good at that, of course, is Trump, because he gives you back the situation, but then he puts a different twist on it that gets you to try to think of it um, in a way that completely undermines your position. Um, yeah. You know, the, the, the term gaslighting came about in talking about sort of there are certain sociopathic personalities, for example, who, you know, will it basically, you know, a person may say, I saw you in the store and you, you turn around and say, no, I wasn't at the store. You must have been seeing things. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe, you know, you should get checked on it. 
get you to question your own sanity, right? Mm -hmm. uh, gaslighting has a, a little bit more of a sort of psychological wedge to it than co-opting per se. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, they're, they're worthwhile terms to get you to understand how the system works. So I, I like that. Um, and we just need to explore what it means so that we can understand, you know, when people are using it against us, right? Yep. All right, cool. Very good. All right, now this is the question that I read last week. And um, it has to do with also what was in that letter that I read at the beginning of class. To build resilience, the trick is to link different goals together, doing economic development, also making it better protection for flood, looking at mobility, how can you increase biodiversity and reduce exposure to extreme heat, um, thinking about governance and community engagement, how do you build trust and confidence. In other words, all solutions should have multiple um, objectives and not just single objective. That's the problem with most engineers' solution is they say, we're gonna solve flooding, and they create other problems because they don't think about those things. And that's what that letter is trying to get at. And so my question to you is, as we look at this, um, provide a thesis, something you think that is, um, maybe it relates directly to your research project. Um, defend it, provide at least three main points that support your logical conclusion and looking at it from a couple of different perspectives and then come up with your conclusion, of course. So this is the idea of, you know, this process of coming up with multiple objectives that we're trying to solve at the same time. So if you think about medical university, for example, multiple objectives would be trying to keep, you know, the university functioning, right? And then also trying to um, deal with it as an environmental issue, trying to minimize runoff, also trying to deal with it as a transportation issue, because now all of a sudden, perhaps we have a basis for rapid transit. Remember, did you guys see the story about how they've decided to extend the bus rapid transit into the city of Charleston? Did you guys see that? I think yeah. when did this happen? I said Yahoo on our um, headlines page, and guess where they're ending up? At the medical university. The medical university is a big enough draw that we can create the kind of um, usage of the system that make it worthwhile, that can help with everybody. The College of Charleston, the medical university wrapped up the whole thing. It's really important. So yeah, we by developing the, the sort of objectives, design objectives at the medical university, we can help transportation, we can help the environment, we can help the functionality and the health, everything at one time, not just one issue. We're not just trying to drain the water away. You get what I'm driving at there? And you start talking about Ellis, you want to get involved with um, West Ashley. Can you see how these, these um, ideas that you come up with can can um, deal with several different problems at the same time? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, it just makes uh, public transportation more viable for people up there. You've got environmental issues you're trying to, you know, uh, deal with uh, flooding. Um, you're trying to, shall we say, uh, put some of the marsh back, which is heavily degraded there. You're trying to create a livable community. You're trying to make it more resilient. Um, you're trying to increase livability by having a walkable community. All these things kind of woven together. So I guess to some extent, you can answer this question by conceptualizing your um, research paper. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So I'm hoping that the two will, will work together in that respect. Uh, Jason and Matt, what about you guys? You guys are working on John's Island. Can you see anything that you can use here? Uh, probably not the bus system. I don't think there would be much of a... No, not that, but yeah. environment certainly, right? Yeah, for sure. And development and trying to create uh, healthy places for people to live, perhaps more dense, but not so spread out. And so consequently minimizing the environmental footprint and making it a more resilient and less flood prone area. So yeah, definitely. These several, so you set multiple objectives that you're trying to deal with whenever you propose a solution. So that's, that's the idea, okay? 
So we talked about um, West Ashley, uh, inner West Ashley, I guess we would say. We talked about the medical university. We talked about Johns Island. Is anybody here working on the Navy yard, Navy place? The, I'm sorry, the Navy base, not place. So we have another group that's working on that. So hopefully we'll catch up with that. Um, but yeah, we need to work on multiple objectives. At the Navy base, we can talk about historic preservation perhaps, but you can also talk about that Ellis, you and Gabriel for South Windermere. That neighborhood really needs to be, you know, put on the National Register um, and that shopping center in particular. Um, and some of the, the provisions of historic preservation will actually should help this process, should help the sort of cultural continuity we're talking about. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. All right, so we've gone through all of this. Um, it's 7.15. What I'd like to do, we can either have people stick around here. I may go grab a beer, actually, at this point, um, since I've been talking for almost two hours, and that's way long. Um, I'm going to stop the recording at this point, if that sounds okay. And, or you can sign up for a time tomorrow 